Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a King Killer Chronicle reread podcast. We are your hosts, Will and Phoenix. Let's get into it. Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, episode 21, The Real Arcanum Was the Friends We Made Along the Way, where we will be looking at chapters 44 and 45 of The Name of the Wind through the lens of currying favor. As longtime listeners know, and newbies who should go back to episode 1 do not, every week we will be examining a section of The Name of the Wind through a chosen lens and then figuring out what we can take from the text and apply it to our real lives. Afterwards, we will take some time to explore models of practical wisdom from the text with an Aristotelian phrenemos of the week, and then expand our understanding of our own world with an interesting fact. At the end of the pod, we will wrap things up with seven words from the book and seven from our own lives. Before we begin, let's get some disclaimers out of the way. First of all, we are in no way affiliated with Patrick Rothfuss or his publisher, Daw Books. Second of all, our discussions are naturally going to assume that either A, you've already read the main books, The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear, as well as the other ancillary novellas and short stories in the continuity, or B, you're a weirdo who likes knowing the future. And hey, there's nothing wrong with being a weirdo. We're pro-weirdo here. (laughs) Needless to say, going forward, here be spoilers. Finally, a word to our community. While it's perfectly fine to critique the text as you read it, we're not going to stand for any abuse of the author responsible for it. With that out of the way, I believe it's your turn to do the recap this week. I think you're correct. And for once I'm prepared. Let me get out a timer here. You got 45 seconds, and if you go over, it's raspberries for you, my friend. (sighs) You'd like that, wouldn't you? I'd love that. I really miss having raspberry things around the house. Like you ever had them around the house. You don't buy them. You're the one who goes out. I might be going a little stir crazy. Just a bit. (laughs) All right. So are you ready? Uh Uh-huh. All right. In three, two, one, go. Kilvin shows off his ever-burning lamp experiments to Kvoth and asks him to study in the fishery. Later, Kvoth, Sim, Will, and Savoy are talking at anchors to help Kvoth decide what the subject he should major in is and which master he should suck up to. Despite all the good advice he is given, Kvoth fixates on the idea of studying with Elodin, who no longer teaches any classes. Savoy leaves for a date, possibly with Denna, and then harasses a server at the inn on his way out. We then get an interlude where Bast gets to be an audience surrogate, and Kvothe tries to fill some plot holes. 36 seconds. Made it. You can always buy yourself raspberry things. Yeah, I can. You're a really big sweetheart, but you can do things for yourself sometimes. It's not my instinct. If I ever left the house and went with you, you'd get some raspberry things. So pretend I'm with you next time. Okay. All right, so this week we chose as our lens currying favor, which I think brings up an often overlooked portion of the university experience, where in many cases it isn't just about what you know, but also who you know and how you know them and your relationship with them. You know, a lot of people will tell you that it's all about academic achievement, which, I mean, while it's important, there's a lot of interpersonal relationship building that really goes a long way. When you go into a job interview, they're not just necessarily looking for a set of skills. They're looking to see if they're going to want to spend eight hours a day with you. This is true. And in my last job, I actually got to help interview people, which took all of my fear for ever interviewing with anyone ever again completely and just chucked it out the window because I am an unprepared, (laughs) not so scary person who should not be looked at with fear when it comes to an interview. I don't know. I think I'm pretty unintimidating. Usually. (laughs) 
when you're in a good mood, you're not intimidating at all. Okay, I'll take that. I was usually more nervous going in to meet somebody who might work with us than I think that they were. <laughs> with the exception of the poor kid who came in for an interview when our conference room was basically a fishbowl. And every time you wanted to leave the office, you had to walk by this glass-fronted conference room. His knee was just shaking the whole time. And everyone saw it. And we all felt terrible for him. Yeah, my first office job out of college, I had an office that was essentially that old fishbowl conference room. And it was really weird because everyone could see you and you could see everyone. It's easy to get distracted and easy to get a little paranoid too. Oh my God, I can't switch to a new tab because what if it's something that somebody else sees and they don't think I'm working? Right. Not only that, it just feels weird just knowing that you don't have any privacy at all. That same office got used for certain external vendors. And at one point they put a couple of contractors who'd come from a major defense company who were already what would generously be called overly vigilant. And this pretty much just freaked them out. Oh. So, yeah, it's not a comfortable place to be. No. Anyway, we digress. <laughs> As is common on this podcast. So in this, we get our first in-depth introduction to Master Kilvin. Already we know that he is essentially an engineer at heart. He is concerned with the solving of problems first and foremost. And in this case, the problem he most wants to solve is how to build a better light bulb. An ever-burning lamp. And one of the things I did notice is that one of his lamps is essentially a light bulb, which I thought was kind of fun. Did you also notice that there were twin lamps, one that had a blue flame and the other that had a hot forge orange? Those are the most common colors for film posters. Red and green also. That's not what I'm talking about. Blue flame? <laughs> ah, right. The Chandrian. Yes. <laughs> Is it a trick of alchemy? They're not the only thing that could cause blue flames. I mean, anytime someone turns on their gas range out here... That'll get you your blue flame. Out here in the real world? Yeah. <laughs> One thing I noticed is that Kilvin is a little dismissive of the lashing that Kvothe had just received the day prior. I get the impression that the shieldish traditions or attitudes or what have you are benignly chauvinistic. I get some of that, and I also think... There is an emphasis on stoicism within their culture. Goes hand in hand with what I said. So Kilvin is primarily interested in Kvothe's intellect, mostly because he thinks that Kvothe will find interesting and new things, and that is something that Kilvin is deeply interested in. I note that a lot of the masters define themselves by being curious, and more so, the masters that Kvothe is drawn to. It's not for nothing. People are oftentimes attracted to people who are similar to them. And, I mean, Kvothe is someone who is defined by a burning curiosity. So it makes sense that people who share similar proclivities would also be drawn towards him. There's something to be said for wanting to spend time with someone who is curious about the world. And if you become a master's apprentice, you're going to be spending a lot of time with them, so you want to make sure that it's someone you'd enjoy. Is that how you view the ranking system, the Illyr to Rilar to Eltha to Giller? Yeah. There's an element of relationship to it, I think, that goes beyond just being in a major, right? The person who sponsors you is in many ways your advisor, and someone who will be spending a lot of time with you. Again, that goes beyond just the natural aptitudes or your scholastic achievements. It speaks to your character and how you work with other people, what your learning style is, what your communication style is. Regardless of 
the stories, the work of being an arcanist, much like being anything else is not a completely solitary profession. In this world, an arcanist is going to have an employer in one fashion or another, whether that's working in, in a court somewhere or as part of the fishery or elsewhere. You're going to be in a situation where you're needing to work with people. And those skills are things that you don't necessarily learn in just a class. You have to practice them in life. I more kind of meant, do you view the university as more of an apprenticeship situation for the roughly thousand students in the Arcanum? Or do you view it more like a university in our world where you are a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, a senior, sometimes a super senior? I think it's a little bit of both. I think pretty much at your entry level, your quote, first termers, you're not necessarily going to have an intense one-on-one -on -one relationship with your professors, but as you go further and you start to specialize, you're going to naturally have a more close relationship with your professors and your relationship with your professors will oftentimes shape how your academic career progresses. I think this is pretty accurate. I wound up having a really good relationship with a lot of my professors. And that good relationship did result in one of my favorite professors recommending me for a job when somebody reached out and said, hey, do you know a UX designer? And then I got the job and it was awesome. I loved the fact that that connection got me in with a group of really talented, really good people. I never saw myself as being a kiss ash or currying favor per se because I built actual real relationships with my professors. They're lasting friendships at this point because of the way that a lot of student teacher relationships have to happen within a school. We weren't able to be truly friends until after I graduated, but really they were all my friends at that point anyway. You just couldn't say so on Facebook. Correct. Though you could be friends on Facebook. <laughs> what we do find out is that Kilvin has been trying this routine of making a new ever-burning lamp just to have it eventually fizzle for over 10 years. Hasn't had an ever-burning lamp yet, just a long-burning lamp. It does seem like the reason that Kilvin asked Quoth to study in the fishery is pretty selfish in that he thinks that Quoth is clever enough to help him with his ever-burning lamp problem. Which speaks a little bit to Kilvin also, because he doesn't have so much pride that he wouldn't let a student get him to a solution for a problem he's had for years. Kilvin is first and foremost a pragmatist. <laughs> Later on, we get our first introduction to Anchors, which is going to be one of the crucial locations in Quoth's life for the next few years. Side note, listened to the books, as you all know. It is spelled differently than I expected. <laughs> Same here. I thought it was spelled like the ship's anchor and nope. Nope. <laughs> That's A-N-K-E-R. Yep. So, I mean, it is a person. Makes sense. It's kind of the platonic ideal of a student pub, which is to say cheap, but not rough cheap, but there won't be any vomiting on them or fights breaking out. Willem and Savoy and Simon are enjoying drinks together to celebrate Quoth's first full span in the Arcanum. A span is approximately a week. It's somewhere between in a week and ten days, and I'm sure we could figure it out if we looked it up. We could. Let's do that. We have the internet. Full disclosure, in our life, Time no longer has meaning. <laughs> it's all Jeremy Baramy. Time is a flat circle. I think we've been living in the eye for months, or it could be hours. Okay, so in the four corners, 11 days are grouped together as a span. So it's first 11 days in the Arcanum. Basically a fortnight. Not quite. Fortnight is 14 days. 
What? It's cute. What's cute? You. Why? The fact that you just know this all off the top of your head. I think it's pretty awesome. I'm allowed to be tickled by that. Sure. Can we get on with yeah, so let's the story? Get, let's get on. Okay. So they're there to celebrate Foth's first 11 days in the Arcanum. As per usual, Sim provides some more exposition, explaining to us, the reader, and Kvoth, who should have known this by now. It's in the handbook. <laughs> Kvoth doesn't read the student handbook. Who do you think he is? Look, he just needs to RTFM. As I expect is normal within a lot of these discussions around a pint of beer, our foursome is talking about which teachers they enjoy, which teachers are, quote, horses. Ashes. At this point, Kvothe is recounting a story about Savoy, who did something rather audacious in that he threatened Mandrag with a riding crop. That's the sort of thing that you have to be extremely well-connected to be able to get away with. Noble privilege. And Savoy is exhibiting a lot of that in this chapter. It's a wonder he didn't get whipped. Seriously. Savoy here also illustrates sort of the fallacy of the meritocracy, where he wants to say that his hard work and dedication and excellence will win through. He doesn't need to, quote, suck up to anybody. It never occurs to him that maybe he really just isn't what Master Mandrag is looking for in a Rilar. Yeah, that's accurate. We get the exposition explanation of how the Medica works. There are set amounts of time that you have to work as an Alir, and then as a Rilar, and then as an Elpha, and then possibly become a Giller. And it makes sense. Master Arwell wants to make sure you've got practice. Well, the verb that most people use for medicine is practicing. And it doesn't matter how brilliant you are, there's no substitute for practice. Of course, Quoth has little patience for such things. <laughs> oh yeah, I understand this completely. I can move on now. <laughs> Skip to the end. And part of that, of course, is rooted in Quoth's economic uncertainty. The first thing he ever thinks of when anyone says this will take longer than you think is how am I going to pay for it? And again, given his circumstances, it's not unusual that he would think in that fashion. Or unreasonable. Overall, everyone continues to tell Kvothe that you should just stick to one subject. Don't try to do everything all at once. Pick a teacher who likes you. Suck up to him. Keep going. And does he listen? No. Will he listen? No. In this conversation, is he listening? No. Because what he does instead is fixate on the idea of studying with a master namer, Elodin, who doesn't teach any classes. And who's also known for being mad as a hatter. Speaking of Mercury, there are theories that the ever-burning lamp is made from Mercury. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it figures that he would naturally assume that the one that he'd need to impress would be the one who falls into that mad hermit role. It would be the one that's unattainable. Again, he wants to study Draculas, so... <laughs> <laughs> He's looking for his Van Helsing. Oh, God. Before we get into the conversation about Elodin within the chapter, Savoy leaves to go have a date, presumably with Denna, as we know Savoy later on does have dates with Denna. And then it breaks poor Savoy's heart when Denna is more interested in Kvothe. Why? I mean, not that Savoy is a great catch, because on the way out, he pays for extra drinks for the other three and slaps the server on the butt for her troubles. It's pretty gross. Yeah. Yeah, that casual sexual harassment is no laughing matter. And no. I feel terrible that the server had to deal with that. Servers in our world have to deal with that. They really shouldn't. 
it definitely paints Savoy in a darker light just because he feels entitled to another person's body just by virtue of his station. Quoth says he's not a bad sort for nobility. And Willem says, it's like he knows he's better than you, but he doesn't look down on you for it because he knows it's not your fault. Wow, is that ever just dripping with patronizing language. Yeah, and that's the most charitable view of it. I also want to note something. After the server comes and says, your buddy over there harassed me, you owe me an apology. Sim stammers an apology, quotation marks heavily implied. He d doesn't mean it. In his culture, that sort of thing is more common. What utter bullshit is this? <laughs> yeah, what this means to me is I don't ever want to go to Modeg. That's one of those things that it means to me as well. I don't care what your culture says. You don't have the right to touch somebody else without consent. No. No, 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 no. And up until this point, sexual harassment has been used as a way to paint someone in a disgusting or unlikable light. But we're supposed to like Savoy? We're supposed to think of him as a rascal, which, um... No. This goes beyond just being mischievous. It's predatory. I want to talk a little bit about Elodin and about the characterization that both Will and Sim are painting him with. Apparently, Elodin used to be Chancellor approximately five years ago. And they go on to refer to him as cracked. Yes. The impression I get is that Elodin is regarded in a kind of patronizing light by the rest of the university. Everyone knows that he's brilliant. Everyone also knows that he's not neurotypical. And no one really wants to call him on it because obviously he seems to have immense knowledge and power. But I was looking at it, like they talk about how he escaped from the crockery. And I couldn't help but wonder, what if he'd been checked in of his own recognizance? And what if he decided that, again, of his own recognizance, he no longer wanted to be there? It's not a prison. It's an institution. I think it comes down also to how we refer to people who have mental illnesses. You and I both have mental illnesses. Mine is generalized anxiety disorder and complex PTSD. And I deal with depression and attention deficit disorder. There is this idea out there that we do not want to talk about mental illnesses for fear that we will become mentally ill ourselves or be seen as mentally ill ourselves. As though admitting to a mental illness is the worst thing ever and should be derided and or feared. The way that Willem and Simon talk about Elodin is... As far as they're concerned, he's one step away from being the Joker. I don't know. I don't know that they think that he's malicious or that he would turn malicious. I think that your analogy of the Mad Hatter is a little more on point. I think we also need to be more cognizant of how we ourselves talk about certain mental illnesses that maybe we don't understand. Anxiety and depression are more understood within our current world within our current vernacular. People understand that there is a difference between being anxious or nervous because of a situation and being diagnosed with an anxiety disorder and panic attacks. People understand that being sad or upset does not mean you have major depressive disorder. They understand the disorder part as something more severe. At the same time, we talk about other disorders, ones that are less understood or more visible without looking quite as distressing 
or maybe that's not accurate because what I'm talking about is OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. There are a lot of jokes going on about how we all need to be a little OCD right now with our hand washing specifically as though it's better to have a disorder that makes you rub your skin raw or to joke about a disorder that disrupts lives. And there are people who don't use it as a joke. They honestly think that one trait of theirs makes them diagnosable as OCD. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot of times you will see in popular culture that trope of mental illness as superpower. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, where a disorder gets narrowed down to a series of traits and the fact is though something becomes a disorder when it disrupts a person's ability to function in their daily life obsessive compulsive disorder is not simply being fastidious and tidy it's about having an obsession obtrusive thoughts yes that you have no choice but to focus on and it compels you to act to relieve those so that may manifest as hand washing compulsively but that's different from being someone who just is being tidy and in a pandemic situation as we are in right now doing such is not being disruptive it is doing your job that's not a disorder behavior and for people who really do suffer from true obsessive compulsive disorder to see it laughed off as something that everyone should be, it really does a lot to diminish what people with that disorder live with in their everyday lives. I think that the same thing happens with attention deficit disorder. A lot of people think that because they're having a day where they can't focus, that they can call themselves ADD. I'm a little ADD today, is what people will say, or I'm a little ADHD today, to add the hyperactivity component to it. And yeah, everyone has days where they're ups and downs and maybe they have a harder time focusing. But that's not the same thing because it doesn't necessarily have that neurological component to it. It doesn't disrupt their lives for days on end. It's not a condition. And Elodin's specific condition is left mostly vague. There is a description of when it happened. We don't know what it is. And in fact, the student body does not seem to know what it is. Which is to be expected, because if one of my professors had some sort of mental break, the school as a whole is not going to broadcast that because it is not the school's place to do so because of confidentiality. And frankly, it's not the school's business to know about that. It's up to the person who's dealing with it to publicize that as they feel is appropriate. Or not. Right. Returning to your point of mental illness as superpower, they kind of do that a little bit here. Quoth seems to be shocked that Elodin used to be the chancellor about five years ago, saying, but he's so young and he wants to finish it with the word crazy. Simon finished the sandwich with the word brilliant. We finish each other's sandwiches. <laughs> and then they go back to exposition explaining how young Elodin was when he went through the university and ultimately became a giller. And that is a hard left turn of we're no longer talking about this. And we get this explanation about the giller who works in the fishery whose name is Kamar, who we really don't see ever again, or in the first place. We just get told that he is a walking poster child for the danger that is posed by working in the fishery, which is where Kvothe will be working. Kamar's face was a web of scars that radiated out, leaving bald strips running through his black hair and his beard. And he had a hollow for his left eye, which, you know, is covered with an eye patch. So... I remember distinctly being in seventh grade shop class and I used to wear oversized sweatshirts 
with a hood that had a drawstring. And I was used as an example of why you tuck your drawstrings in or take the jacket off or what have you. And I will never forget this because our shop teacher talked about the belt sander and grabbed one of my strings on my jacket like my cat would right now if he was allowed to and then just yanked at it not hard just yanked and explained that that is what would happen if it got stuck in the belt sander but my face would be sanded off i also note that there's a little echo of the story of odin here who traded his eye for runes sigils <laughs> 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 well, Patrick Rothfuss does seem to stick a lot of these things into his novel. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but it was just an interesting little parallel that he traded his eye for knowledge. <laughs> and then we get a brief interlude in Back at the Waystone, where Quoth essentially lays out that while this isn't life in a story... He still operates according to story logic, and obviously he wants to pick the person who will be that spirit guide role as Elodin, because he's still fixated on being the next Taverlin. And who better than someone who is the person who seems to know the names of all things and has engineered this great escape, and who is this prodigy, much like he sees himself, of course he's going to pick Master Elodin. So before we get done with this section... I note that Bast asks a question of Coat or Quoth that a lot of people who are reading this story might also ask of Patrick Rothfuss. Why didn't you go back for Scarpy? I picked up on that too. <laughs> One thing that is interesting to me and I think is probably telling about Bast is he is asking this question because he's already engineered events to bring Chronicler and Scarpy into the story in an effort to reawaken Quoth from the Mask of Coat. So he's obviously, I think, got his own little question on there. Is this meant as more of a divert suspicion, or is this meant as more of a remember this person? I think it's a remember this person. Ah. And the reason I point this out is because Scarpy was the person who reawakened Quoth after Tarbian, that portion of the sleeping mind. And I think Bast is hoping maybe Scarpy might have that same effect again. Mm. And that is where we leave it. Except there is that little cliffhanger at the end. I did find something very near to the mad hermit in the woods, Quoth smiled. And I was determined to learn the name of the wind. Hey, that's the name of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so now it is time for us to discuss our Phronemos of the Week. And I'd like to start things off with a quote from the philosopher Jack Handy. If you saw two guys named Hambone and Flippy, which one would you think liked dolphins the most? I'd say Flippy, wouldn't you? You'd be wrong, though. It's Hambone. By the same token, this week's Phronemos is Simon. The ham bone of the four corners. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay, explain. So, initially, you were thinking I would pick Kilvin because he is one of my favorite masters. And, yeah, there's something to that. I like him because he's pragmatic, he's curious, and kind of funny. But I picked Simon because Simon really captures the relational aspect of learning. And I really thought that his expression of, yeah, you have to suck up, while that may be a little crude, it does point to the importance that relationship building does play in our lives, both academically and professionally. The people that you work with are people that you're going to spend the most time in your life together with. And that's something that goes a long way, and it will really shape the way that you're able to act. As much as one might subscribe to that smartest guy in the room trope where sheer brilliance is enough to win you success and afford you respect, 
the fact of the matter is that in real life, characters like Sherlock or House don't actually progress very far in their careers because they alienate everyone around them. And the people who actually progress are the ones who are able to build meaningful and lasting relationships with others, who are able to express empathy and are able to care about other people. That's what actually helps you to be successful in a meaningful way, more than just pure expertise. That's why I picked Simon. It was a good choice. Thank you. And with that, speaking of Master Elodin, it's time for us to take to heart his lessons with an interesting fact of the week. It's your turn for that. What do you got? I have one that I think that you'll like. Okay. You know how Master Kilvin is always obsessed with his search for an ever-burning lamp? Mm -hmm. What if I were to tell you that there is currently an ever-burning city within the United States? Well, that's terrifying. The ever-burning city is Centralia, Pennsylvania. It was once a thriving town with an economy largely based around the coal mining industry. That is, until 1962, when it is believed that a trash fire in a local landfill spread to the underground coal mine that lies beneath the town. Yeah. The fire has been burning for over 58 years, and it shows no sign of stopping anytime soon despite the fact that the state of Pennsylvania spent more than $7 million before even the two of us were born trying to put this fire out. So before the early 1980s, they had already sunk $7 million into this. Experts say that it will likely still be burning 100 years from now. Photos taken in 1983, more than 20 years after the fire began, show one of the residents being able to fry an egg in a pan held over one of the hot spots. And the heat from the fire went on to destroy most of the buildings and roads in the town over the following decades. This is because the soil temperatures exceed 60 degrees Celsius, which is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Regardless of this, and the fact that the governor of Pennsylvania has tried extreme measures like revoking Centralia's zip code, which is a postal code for those of you not living in the U.S. As of 2019, there were still at least six residents who refused to leave their burning hometown. Okay, so that is tragic and horrifying. And I have two bonus facts for you. Okay. One, Centralia, Pennsylvania is the town that served as inspiration for the town of Silent Hill in the video game of the same name. Because I can't not bring things back to video games, apparently. <laughs> Second bonus fact. While the area is no longer strictly hospitable to human residents, it is very welcoming to microbes, which are known as thermophiles. Okay, so this is tragic and horrifying and absolutely fascinating. So yes, you have interested me. Wow, that, oh, that is, oh. Uh-huh. No raspberries for you this week. Thank you, appreciate it. And so now it is time for us to share seven words. This week I have seven words from the book and my choice is a healthy tip makes a fine apology. This was uttered, of course, by the server at Anchors. And this is something I think that many of us should remember in this time where, for many businesses, delivery and takeout are the lifeline for many workers and businesses. A healthy tip is what is helping people to survive. And if you have enough disposable income to do so, and you decide that you want to order food from a restaurant, really ought to be saying thank you in a way that you can, which is tipping better. I know it's a convenience. I know that there is this thought that you shouldn't have to tip, but the reality is in the United States, you really do have to tip. Yeah, there's a minimum wage. And if you've never been a worker for a restaurant, 
you would not be remiss in believing that all servers get at least minimum wage and that your tips go on top of that. But in many states, that's not the case. Some of them make sub $2 an hour and have to make it up with your tips. And if you decide that you can't pay $15 for a hamburger and then also pay for a tip, maybe don't order the hamburger. The tip is part of the budget. And this is what these servers are relying on for their livelihoods. And it also gets not just for the server, it goes often for the back kitchen staff, like the dishwashers, the chefs, the bussers, and bartenders. So it's spread out across the entire ecosystem of that restaurant. So remember, tip kindly. And I believe it is your turn for seven words from life. You are correct, sir. These are very specific to me. I am our social media coordinator, if that's a title you want to give me. Means that I make a lot of things and stick them up on Instagram. And a lot of our Instagram followers like pictures of the book much more than they like the things that I actually spent time on. But that's fine, I guess. No complaints. Mm. Anyway. My seven words for this week are, I love seeing translated editions on Instagram. This can be translated editions of The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear, but also a lot of other books. I like seeing graphic design in the form of book covers. I like seeing what other countries and other areas get as their book covers. Because translated editions tend to have art that was commissioned by the foreign foreign publisher. And let's be honest, I think that the U.S. editions of The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear look super boring. I would much rather have the editions from the U.K., which, luckily enough, are also in English. But there are also some from... Germany or from Portugal or other countries that are not coming to me off the top of my head, sorry guys, that have much more interesting artwork that is much more evocative and would be much more appealing to me if I didn't believe in a book being more than its cover. But I like seeing the translated editions of Neil Gaiman books. And I like seeing the translated editions of pretty much everything I read as done by other artists. It fascinates me because book covers are a form of marketing and it feels like the tone is set by the artwork on the outside. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, Terry Pratchett has always been one of my favorite authors and the UK covers for the Discworld books are all illustrated and there are all these really kind of almost grotesque illustrations of life in the Discworld. And then the US covers are just really banal. They're just a single color with a single image that isn't really even necessarily of a character or anything like that. It's just an emblem really. and. I just remember that it did no justice to the tone of the series, and it was just boring. The U.S. covers of a lot of things are boring, and I don't like that. I think that's changing, but I think there was a period of time, like in the 90s, and sometimes these haven't been updated, where the design of the book was not meant to enhance the story. I think part of it is, among publishers, they had really internalized the never judge a book by its cover, so why bother with a cover? Right. <laughs> Let's make this functional in terms of its physical presence rather than functional in terms of its whimsical presence. Yeah. <laughs> and with that, I'd like to thank you for potting with me. Thank you for potting with me. And thank you, audience, for listening to Tales from the Waystone. Join us next week on Tales from the Waystone as we discuss chapters 46 through 48 of The Name of the Wind through the lens of recklessness.
We would like to extend a huge thank you to Shawnee Jang for our theme music. And many thanks to Patrick Rothfuss for creating a world that we've enjoyed exploring. Audio production, editing, and social media coordination, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. Project management and writing, courtesy of me, Will McCullough. If you would like to help support us, please consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash waystonepod. And as always, here's to one more day above the roses. To one more day above the roses. Excuse me. Bless you. That's the first sneeze I've caught. It's been 21 episodes. And that's the first time you've sneezed on Mike. <laughs>